The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. All right, guys, good morning. Um, my name is Joe Ottinger. I'm an employee of Red Hat, uh, working primarily with Fedora and in the Open Source and Standards Group. Um, what I wanted to do today was uh, talk about a project that we kind of put together, kind of playing around with things to try to figure out um, what issues will be involved in creating new musical instruments. Um, the way that we did this was, you know, because I'm a musician and an engineer, I approached it like an engineer would. Musicians tend to be kind of, you know, let me bang something against the wall and see if I can record that, and you get music out of that, and then all of a sudden you have an album of someone banging things against the wall, which, you know, generated a couple of Pink Floyd albums. So you see that sort of thing has happened, but it's generally been very uh, haphazard. Um, I don't really like that too much. I like to actually, you know, because I'm an engineer, I like to have control, so naturally, the AV wasn't set up when we got here. Um, you know, actually, you can see my beautiful slides, which aren't here because I ran a system upgrade this morning and naturally broke OpenOffice. So I get to do everything from memory, which will be fine, but a little bit less organized than I had it. It's probably to your benefit. Um, the project that I chose was primarily some MIDI foot pedals. I'm a guitarist by trade. Um, and as a guitarist, uh, one of the things you like to do is you like to play with things on, you know, you have foot pedals that control distortions and things like that. But I don't like just playing guitar. I do a lot of other things on stage. I play a lot of prog rock and stuff like that. So I like to have synthesizers to play with as well. But when you're playing guitar, your hands are kind of occupied. So the feet are the natural thing. You got the Moog Taurus pedals and things like that, which kind of set the standard for, uh, for controlling synths on stage with Rush and Genesis and, and bands like that. So I thought um, the, the, the first thing that I wanted to do was create something known. I wanted to start off, for one thing, put pedals kind of have a certain musician geek cred. Um, but the other side is that the, the thing about foot pedals is you know what they're supposed to do. Um, when you play a theremin, which is an instrument where you kind of wave your hands in front of it, if you've heard the Beach Boys, um, the, the Beach Boys have that little, uh, I forget the name of the song, Barbara Ann, I think it's, there's a kind of warble thing in there. It's someone playing with their hands or kind of waving their hands in front of an instrument and getting music out of it. Well, that's all great, and I like the idea of the theremin, but the problem is, what is it supposed to actually generate? When you wave your hand here, is it supposed to generate a C, or is it supposed to generate an E, or is it, you know, where, you don't know what the inputs are supposed to be. You're kind of doing that same, throw it against the wall and see what comes out of it, and if it's usable, that's great. But you're not really working with something predictable. And as an engineer, it's much better to say, when I hit this, I want to get this output. You know, which, you know, again, musicians normally don't do that a whole lot. They do it some because you're working with old, you know, you know how the chords are supposed to sound. But in general, most, you know, when you're designing something new like that, you really kind of are throwing against the wall and hoping you get something usable out. And again, I don't like that a whole lot. So what I wanted to do was I can create something where I know that my inputs are supposed to look like this and my outputs look like that. Then, once I have that, I can say, I've solved all the issues. I've solved the issues around generating music. Now I can start thinking about, well, 
do I want to wave my hand in front of something? You know, do I want to build a laser harp? Do I want to um, have something that works on temperature? Whatever the case may be, at least I'll have the issues solved so then I can free my, uh, my design from, you know, how do I generate the sound and into what do I want to do to create the sound? Um, I did set some limitations on the project. Um, I set my requirements. Uh, I have some optional requirements and th things like that. The, the first requirement is I had to be able had to generate MIDI. Um, MIDI is the the uh, the standard music creation thing, uh, the standard for protocol, the standard protocol for creating music. Um, it is not perfect. Um, it's based on serial protocols, so that it's it's all one note at a time. You don't play a chord. You actually send three notes immediately after each other. Um, it's based on 31250 baud, so it's kind of slow for today's you know serial devices. Um, and you know it's it's fairly well defined, but it is very limited. I mean, you know, we are used to chromatic music. We're used to Western music, which is based on a 12-note scale. Um, and you know, MIDI doesn't handle microtones. So if you're doing Eastern music where you have 24 or 25-note scales, where you've got a lot of intermediate notes, MIDI doesn't really do that very well. But we're in the West, so Western music works. And MIDI's okay. I, um, I wanted to have it, for one, uh, playable. It had to be tough enough to actually handle people banging it. Um, you know, we wanted to take it on shows so the kids could go out and hammer it, play whack-a-mole with it. It also needs to be heavy enough that when you're playing it, it doesn't fly off the stage, uh, which can be a problem if you're actually playing somewhere. All of a sudden, someone in the front row gets hit with this 40-pound thing coming at them. And then all of a sudden, of course, you don't have anything you can play anymore. Um, I did not, I wanted, I had as an optional requirement that it generates sound itself. Um, the inspiration for this started off with, like I mentioned, the Moog Taurus back in the late 60s. The Moog Taurus is an actual synthesizer. It has its own oscillators. It will generate sound itself. I would have liked to have done that. However, um, it was always secondary because the way that most bands do music today is, for, for one thing, they have a CD that plays all the music, so there's no actual musicians anymore. Um, but for, for those who do play music, generally you have a bank of synthesizers behind the stage that's about, you know, it's in a 42U rack, and everything on stage just controls those. You don't have a whole lot of sound generation on stage anymore. Sometimes you do. You have a lot of retro bands. A lot of people do still do it because of the retro cool. They'll play the Nord synthesizers, or they'll, or they'll have the moves. But in general, your general the, the standard practice is to control it off stage because you know, that frees the musician from having to set everything up. You can just change the MIDI channel, and all of a sudden you, you're talking to a different synthesizer, much more convenient, much more controllable for a stage environment. For the, big, for the larger bands where you're playing to 1,000 or 10,000 or 20,000 people, you want that predictability. And having someone accidentally twist the knob and all of a sudden your sound is un, you know, impossible to hear is not a good thing on stage. Um, so my requirements were, again, MIDI. Um, not, uh, sound is optional. Um, I had to be able to uh, change the parameters. I needed to be able to do transposition. I needed to be able to change octave and things like that. So I needed some control on stage. Um, and I need to have it heavy enough that it wasn't going to fly around. Um, I then started working through my requirements. My first requirement was, of course, the physical procurement of the pedals. I and mean, this is actually built off, ripped off of a, a Lowry organ. Um, from, the pedals are probably 50 to 60 years old. It's one of those old things back in the 40s that everyone's grandmother, grandmother used to have. Um, I actually just ordered it off of eBay. You know, you can just you can pirate the thing. Um, so that part was fairly easy, but then I had to figure out how do I generate input from these things? How does the actual switch work? Basically, in the back of the, of the pedals, there's a rocker. Whenever you press the pedal, the rocker goes across, there's a spring that gets dragged across and you build a contact. Well, okay, I've got a simple switch. It's got a great switch. Um, and that was one of the issues that I had to address later, and we'll talk about that. But um, Actually, you know, that was the first thing. Can I actually generate my input? Can I tell when something is pressed? Well, the answer for that is pretty simply yes. You hook up a light, you know, and run power to it, and you close the circuit. Okay, I can tell which one's pressed. It's fairly easy. I actually ripped out a, uh, a CV gate uh, mechanism that's about, you know, yay tall with these capacitors that were about, you know, four inches long. Um, 
but I actually ripped all of that out because I figured, well, I'm going to build my own system. I don't need what's already there. And plus, what's there is based on uh, CV gate, which is one volt per node. So I, I'm working with low power devices, so one volt's going to create a lot of smoke and light, but no sound, um, except for maybe an initial pop. Um, so then the next thing I, I worked on was I went to an Arduino, which is an 18 mega, a very tiny device. Um, the Arduino, what I decided to do was I was going to try to see if I could get the Arduino to tell which note was pressed, because now that I can tell that a note is pressed, I need to be able to determine which one. So I set up what's called a resistor ladder, which is, I had a beautiful picture of it, but now I don't. Um, the resistor ladder basically is a chain of resistors where, where you hook up the switch to close the res oh, a resistor in this ladder. And the further down the, down the ladder you close the switch, the higher the resistance that comes through. So you can tell just by sampling, you get 50% you know, resistance, it's this node. It's 40% resistance, it's that node. Which was great, except for a couple of things. One, the resistors are kind of low quality, so there's a lot of variance in the signal that comes through. Second, the actual rocker switch is a physical switch, so it creates a lot of bounce. Um, bounce is what happens whenever you first close a switch, you don't actually get a solid signal. It's not like turning on a light. You actually get a little bit of flicker. If you look through an oscilloscope, you actually see a, a lot of variation until the, until the signal stabilizes. So that meant that when I was sampling, I would get all of these variants, you know, all these wide variations of data, and then it would stabilize and I can sort of tell. But the resistors themselves aren't stable. So my resistor ladder, for one thing, exhibited some bounce, so I've got, I have a difficult time telling when something actually starts. But I also had to deal with the signal, the, the variation in the signal itself, which kept on tripping past the ranges. I mean, I could say that 50% was, was this node, but my actual resistance, even holding down that note, would go from 50 to 60 to 40 to 70, or just a blip here and there. So there's a lot of noise in the signal, even not counting bounce. So I wrote a, a routine, a software debouncing um, routine that basically did an oversampling. It would sample the signal 13, 40 times, and yes, 13, 240 to 50 times, trying to figure out where I could stabilize the signal, where I could tell, yes, I have a note, or yes, I have a change, and it's this note, because I needed to filter out all the noise. And I did this with a Fourier transform, probably the first time that I've used a Fourier transform in the real world. Um, probably the first time I've done a Fourier transform in the real world that you know actually had a, a point to it. And whenever the system comes back up, um, oh there it is. However, the Fourier transform on the Arduino meant that I had a giant lag in my data. By the time that I could tell a note was pressed. We were looking at anywhere from 12 to 30 milliseconds of a delay, and which was a, I could get it down, but I couldn't get it stabilized. So I could tell almost immediately. I mean, if I was looking for a change, I could determine a change within three to four milliseconds. The problem is that for me to stabilize that took about, like I say, you know, roughly 20, 40 milliseconds, which is far too long. You, know, you can hear that. Um, so something had to change. Um, at that point, I thought, well, you know, I've got a, this Arduino, and it's all great, and it's cheap and kind of fun, but I really kind of would like to go a little bit bigger. The Arduino isn't going to ever be able to generate sound, which was one of my optional requirements. Um, so I had the Pi, so I thought, well, I've got a Pi. It's got a lot of inputs. It's, time, it's actually got a real processor, and it's got multi-threading. It's running a real operating system, which Linux, you go figure what it's in you know, yourself. Um, so I went ahead and switched over to the Pi because of the uh, tool support, because of the possibility, the better I.O. requirements, and also the higher speed, because the 18 mega is a 16 megahertz chip, which is fine, but the, you know, 800 megahertz to a gig, you know, gigahertz is kind of a little bit more fun for the, you know, for the geeks among us. So that was the, that was the next thing. Go ahead and rip out everything with the, uh, with the Arduino and switch over to the Pi. The Pi does not have any analog inputs. The Arduino does, so I needed to change how I was actually det determining the note. This seemed like a good time to actually revise how I was determining the data because the notes were, again, I was getting a lot of fluctuations, so I couldn't really do, there was a, a lack of usability there. 
So I went ahead and switched over to a digital input, um, which is, you know, I'm hooking into an MCP2308 chip, which is a multiplexer chip. Um, now I can actually tell, I don't have any variation of note anymore. I know that I'm pressing note five because it's the only, that's the only input that's going to be hooked up there. I still have to deal with bounce, but I no, have, no longer have to worry about which note is depressed. Um, so then, you know, I can take my same Fourier transform, except I'm working with digital numbers now, so it's no longer even a transform. It's just let me take 13 samples, let me count which one's higher. Do I have more on than off? Well, there's my current status. Going to Linux meant that I could also change how I was designing the state machine. Um, and the Arduino uses a micro microcontroller, and so it's very much built on ladder programming. It's very much a state machine. You basically run a loop and loop and loop and loop and loop and check what's changed. Do I need to do something? And so you have a giant if, basically. Um, well, using Linux meant that I had real threading. So I no longer have to worry quite the same thing about having a giant state machine. I can actually do a series of state machines and just use threading. Um, no I'm no longer using the Arduino wiring system. I'm using C++ directly. I can use any operating system or any language. I could have used Python. I could have used uh, Java if I'd wanted to. I could have used anything, but C++ just seemed to be a little bit closer for the metal, and plus I was already using a variant of C++ for the Arduino, so it was an easy port. Um, so basically what I ended up doing was just writing a series of classes to take my input, debounce the input, uh, again, just oversampling and counting. Um, and then I'll, I'm, I'm at this point with my testing, I've got my inputs, I'm able to determine my inputs in about uh, three to four milliseconds, which is well within tolerance for musical instruments. You're, I mean, a professional, a professional instrument is gonna give you three to four milliseconds internally just because it takes time to determine some of those things. You can get that down, but because the human ear can't even begin to hear a, variant, a variation at seven milliseconds, you're, there's no point. You can get it down, but there's, why? You know, the human brain is never gonna be able to process that. As long as you can keep that, as long as you can keep that, note, that range down, you're okay. So, I've now fulfilled a couple of my milestones. I've got the pedals. Um, at this point, I've got this you know, giant that's all over my work table. Um, but I am able to, to determine quickly what note is pressed and when, when it's off. I haven't addressed anything on actually sending data out yet. Um, I haven't actually generated the MIDI protocol at all. Um, at first, it seemed really easy because I'm just hooking up a serial connection and I'm just watching for data coming across. However, the Pi does not actually generate, the serial bus in the Pi does not generate the right baud rate for MIDI. Um, it, gener it can generate 33K, it can generate 28.8, but it can't do 31.250, which, thank you, MIDI's, I mean, why, why 31.250? I mean, they had better available, why, why bother? I can't tell you, and I won't tell you, and I, I had lots of nice words for them when I was going through this. But you can actually overclock the, the, US, the serial chip. So that was the next thing that I had to figure out how to do, which was fairly easy, but you still had to do it, basically overclocking the chip and then uh, writing at 28.8, so it ends up being the right rate. It's within tolerance for MIDI. So then I was able to actually generate MIDI going through a DIN 5 connector. So now I'm able, able to actually work on generating music. At this point, I actually hooked up something called an aux on a MIDI channel, so I'm actually watching the notes coming through, so it was actually turning something on and turning it off. I've got music at this point. Maybe not usable music because you're, you've got it all over my table, but it's music, and it's a start. So my other requirements were transposition related, which were how do I control what channel the data is coming out on and what note am I actually generating? Am I, you know, I'm, generating middle C, which is maybe fine, but you don't want to control your synthesizer to generate a note. You want to actually, actually have the device itself control what note's coming out. Um, so I needed to think about input and output for the device itself. Um, originally, I was going to hook up an LED screen and have switches that you could actually press. So you've got these you know, giant things you step on. Um, however, it just seemed like a kind of low-tech solution. So I needed to figure out, you know, what's a better way to do it? How can I do off-board control? 
Well, I could hook up, hook up another MIDI device to this one because it's you know, a channel thing and have it watch on its own channel, but that seems kind of um, dumb. You know, why would you have a MIDI controller for a MIDI controller? It just doesn't. You know, I guess there's, there's a certain insanity involved, but I didn't like that idea. So um, I wanted to think about how can I get you know, off-board controlling, you know, the LED would, would be nice, the LCD would be nice, or external control, but even that kind of drives up my price because I also kind of wanted to keep the price low so that my wife wouldn't be upset at how much money was being spent. Go figure. Um, so I could do a screen, but the screens are $50. That's my price point going way up. I could do a keyboard, but the keyboards are 10 bucks. Well, I mean, they're, and they're giant. And plus, on screen, on stage, you don't want to be messing with a, with a typewriter, with an uh, ordinary you know, QWERTY keyboard. So the next thing I thought of was actually this thing, which, well, this is just an X3, but any phone would work. I mean, everyone has a phone now. Every phone has Wi-Fi or, or Bluetooth capability. Why not rely on this? What, you know, the idea, ideal, ideally, you'd have a tablet, so it'd be a little bit larger. But you could actually have this on a music stand, and if you needed to control it, play with this. But that meant that this had to be network aware, um, which works out well, except for you have to actually work out the, the wireless access point, and you actually have to build an access point, um, which is fairly easy, except we, we also have power requirements. The Raspberry Pi only generates about 700 to 800 milliamps, and hooking up a wireless dongle tends to drive it into a reboot loop. Um, so the next thing that I discovered that I had to deal with was power. How much power can I generate in this thing? How much, what do I need to actually get enough power to drive the Raspberry Pi, get all of the inputs, plus drive the wireless so that I can actually control all of this? Um, not to mention how do I control it, because I'm, I'm just trying to connect, talk to it at this point. Um, well, the answer there, of course, is a, a powered USB hub. So it actually has two, two, wire, two uh, power connections coming out of it, which is kind of a drag. Eventually, I need to consolidate it into one. But um, you know, it was still something that I had to consider and find out. So now I know that I need to actually consider power in my design, because the Pi needs power itself, plus the, the wireless needs power, or I need to figure out some other way to actually control the data coming out. Um, actually, hooking up the access point is fairly easy. There's host APD and, and UDHCPD, which is DHCP being controlled through here. Host APD is a wireless, you, know, you can actually set up a wireless ac access point. If you look on your device, if you look for the local networks, you should see Alcyony, which is the name of this thing. I'll, um, my slides actually talked about why it's called Alcyony, and I'll cover that in a bit. Um, but you know, without the slides, it doesn't really help. Um, the, so once I had the wireless set up, once I could talk to it without actually having a physical connection to it, then it turns into a question of how do you talk to it? Um, I can design a, uh, we could use Bluetooth, I guess, and that would get, get around some of the things. Um, but you, then you're still talking about protocol. How do you, what do you actually use to talk to the LCNE itself, to the device? Um, I chose HTTP because it's very simple. Um, it's easy to find. Um, you can actually design a web page, I guess, if you wanted to, to actually do, the, do all the communication, just passing in messages with REST, and you're just doing represent, representational state, get state back in and out. Um, I actually did, uh, actually wrote an actual Android application to do that, um, so that it's not using a web page, although, it, you know, again, it could, it just doesn't yet, because I wanted to kind of play with, with polyglot programming as well. Um, so the Android application is very simple. Um, it basically connects to a known host, uh, which is given to it by the access point. It basically sends a message that says, give me the status, or change the, change the state to be, you know, change the MIDI channel up or down, change the, uh, transposition, change note transposition up or down, change the octave up or down. On the code, it's actually just a thread. You know, I mentioned that I was using C++, and I'm just using the Boost libraries to run a series of threads. One of the threads watches for input. One of the threads actually flashes some internal lights so that I have to make sure the system is running properly. And one of the threads is an HTTP server, and it just watches for very simple messages and spits them back out. 
Um, that's using the web++.hpp, which is this, uh, a web server embedded in a single include. Um, it was just the simplest and shortest path to what I wanted to do. Um, I didn't see any reason in going for a full let me embed in Jinx or anything like that. It's just too much work. Um, so once I had all that, once I had set up the Android to actually be able to set up as a control circuit, um, I have the ILC and the actually generating MIDI. At this point, I'm really almost done except for the case. Um, a friend of mine worked, was a naval engineer, worked on submarines, and he was like, well, you know, I can help with that. And I told him, well, you know, sure, why not? And he said, well, here it is, it's finished. And okay, thank you. Um, but at this point, I actually have a functioning musical instrument, and we can actually play it, which is all nice. It's just, again, it's generating to CAF, uh, which is you know, the, one of the Linux synthesizers. It can generate anything, um, talk to anything. I've run it to an organ that's polyphonic. Um, I can run it to a sampler. You can run it to anything. It is an actual functioning musical instrument. I've used it on stage. Um, and the main thing that comes out of it is, for one thing, it's kind of cool. But another aspect of it is that you do actually, I do actually have a list, a laundry list of things that we can use to help others generate the same kind of design. We know, you know, I can now tell you, for one thing, what kind of power requirements you're likely to have, um, what your issues are going to be in configuring the Pi to generate MIDI, at the very least. Sound is a different issue because I'm still working on actually generating it as a sin. Um, but we have the, the wireless part. I can actually take most of the guts of this, rip it out, and build a new instrument. If I wanted to have a new type of input, all I'd have to do is hook it up to an analog, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be. Uh, if I wanted to build a theremin, I could, um, within the limits of MIDI, of course. Um, and that's kind of where MIDI, the 12-note scale, comes in because the theremin is, is very much a resistor-driven a resistor instrument so that it generates notes that aren't necessarily on the scale. MIDI doesn't do that very well. Um, the name, I mentioned that early on. My slides actually addressed it really early. I'm sorry about the slides. Um, the name comes from the Taurus constellation. Um, Moog, back in the late 50s, late 60s, we actually had this idea that he would create a, a synthesizer, um, a rack of synthesizers, because they were, all, they were all modular back then, so they were all racks to begin with, but he had the, this idea that he would have a, a synthesizer system, and he called it the Constellation. So you had different pieces, um, you had the Taurus, and you had the Pisces, and you had all these different you know, Zodiac-type things that went into this giant synthesizer thing that probably would have cost about $30,000 back then. Um, and the Taurus was the only one that I know of that he actually built for mass production, which is the foot pedal one. Um, well, I kind of, I like the Taurus a lot, so I thought, well, I'll use something like the Taurus in the name. In the Taurus constellation, the brightest star is Aldebaran, which, uh, it's too long to say, it's too hard to say, nobody wants to say, this is the Aldebaran, so that's out. The second brightest star in the Taurus constellation is the Tau, which is unfortunately the name of another instrument from Eigenharp. So I was thinking, well, I know the people from Eigenharp, so I don't want to borrow their name for my own instrument. The third one is Alcyone, which was named after a Greek heroine who commit, tried to commit suicide. That part it wasn't all that great, but at least the name was fairly easy to, to, to pronounce and it sort of has a tie-in with, uh, with the, or the origin of the design. So, um, without the slides, I'm kind of pacing, my pacing's a little bit off, and I apologize about that. But I wanted to kind of ask, were there any questions about anything that I've covered so far? Yes, sir? The multiplexing uh, chip that you're using, then you're going into the GPIO? Yes, sir. It's uh, basically an I2C. I've got three I2C uh, chips in there, the MCP23008. Um, it's, eight, it's multiplexing eight bits in the, into a single channel. Um, I have three of them in there. Two, one is used for output, the other two are for input. So I can have 16 inputs that are, just, that, that are dedicated. I can, you can actually individually address the bits. Um, so I could have you know, input, output, input, output. There's no point. It's easier just to do a block read and a block write. 
Um, I actually have the, the code actually does a block read and a block write for all of those things. Um, I could do individual bit reads without a significant loss in speed because the I2C bus is incredibly fast. Um, however, again, it just came down to why bother? I mean, I've got the IO, just go ahead and do a block read eight bits at a time, and then you, don't even, then you can just cycle through those eight bits and check your statuses. But yes, it's the MCP 2308. I could have used the MCP 23017 and gotten 16 at a time. Um, at my workbench, I did not have one, so I used what I had. Um, again, the latency, the total latency works out to about five to seven milliseconds through, you know, when you hit the node, it's actually taking about, it's about, it's hard to gauge, you know, hard to gauge because there's, there are, it's not a real time system. Um, that was one of the things that some of the people who, who I've talked to who do work, who do design musical instruments like the Eigenheart people were saying, well, you know, Linux isn't real time unless you're using Linux real time, which I'm, I wasn't. The, the thing about real time, um, real time doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean speedy. It doesn't mean fast. It means predictable. So real time, it's perfectly acceptable for it to take longer as long as you can guarantee that it ha something happens within a span of time. Real time might be 100 millisecond granularity, but real time means that at that 100 millis hundredth millisecond, you are guaranteed for something to have happened. That's why real time is important for medical devices. When you're, when you're having a heart attack, you don't want you know, your device to go through a garbage collection process when you, know, you kind of need the jolt to get your heart going. Um, so a lot, of me, a lot of the people that I was speaking to were suggesting that I use real time so I could guarantee that I had response within four to 10 milliseconds. But I didn't, you know, I, I wasn't doing that because I'm going for a simpler approach. Real-time programming is kind of a pain. You work with a lot of state machines. The Arduino certainly uses it. Um, but I'm, you know, the, what I found was there wasn't really a necessity for real-time. Um, I'm not doing a whole lot of memory allocation in my C++. Um, I'm not doing a lot of deallocation. There's no fragmentation. The swap on the Raspberry Pi is not being touched. Um, it's there because I never really, I never got rid of it because I never needed to. But honestly, the, the program runs in about 120K, um, start to finish. There's no, you know, there, it doesn't do a whole lot of stack allocation. It doesn't do a whole lot of memory allocation. So there's no fragmentation to deal with. So even on a low end processor like the Broadcom, um, even using a non real time operating system, I really don't have any, uh, I have not had any severe glitches in terms of the sound coming out. Um, it is a multi-threaded application, so I do have to consider the impl implications of using multi-threading, namely that you know, I'm using a single bus to write to and read from, so I do have to make sure that I'm not reading, you know, writing a register, then writing another register from another thread, then pulling the data back out, because then I'll get noise coming back out. Um, because of the, no the denoising system that's in there, um, theoretically, I could get that noise and it wouldn't affect anything because it would just be one data point and the denoising would get rid of it. But it is still something to consider in, in your design. If I had a much larger system, if I had more threads to deal with, it might be more, more sensitive to that, uh, to that noise. Um, everything about this, by the way, is open source. Um, if you go to GitHub, you can find the code as it's running right now. Um, and open source actually played really heavily into the whole design. Um, I mentioned that I'd talked to the people at Eigenharp, I'd talked to a lot of other musicians. Um, the open source ethic actually played very strongly into it. Um, you know, for one thing, you know, on Windows, because I've used Windows as well you know, for other things, but when you look at the Windows programming environments, it's all like, they all, even, even Windows programmers kind of see it as magic. You know, they're, they're really users that have a very specific area where they kind of modify things, and that's their programming. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm just a user, but I write this point of sale system. You know, in, in Linux, the whole mindset is, no, you're not a user at all. You're always, even as a, you know, even when you're writing a, a, a document, you're programming something. You know, LaTeX is all about this programming a document format. Um, even using LibreOffice, you're kind of doing the same thing. You're thinking about the states as you're writing it. Maybe most people don't think of it that way when they're actually doing it. But that mindset is, just permeates Linux. Um, 
And I found that very useful because I had a lot of people who were able just to say, have you thought about this? You know, in Windows, you don't have that. In, in other operating system environments, you don't have that maker mentality that says, you know, let me give you advice. Have you thought about this? Do you know about this? What about this? What about that? Simply because the environment doesn't encourage it. Microsoft says, you do what we say. Apple says, we're not going to even tell you, but you're just going to do it anyway. Whereas with the Linux mentality with BSD, with the whole open operating system, the maker mentality is very much participatory. Where I had a 12-year-old boy a couple of weeks ago tell me, you can fix a bug by doing this. And he had no idea what the code looked like and he was not quite correct. But the fact that he was offering me a solution based on something that he figured out, well, I think it's written like this. If, you're, if it was written like this, you could do this. That mentality is incredibly useful. I was impressed by this you know, kid just because you know, he's coming up with, I mean, that's the whole thing. That mentality comes up and says, I'm going to actually be part of what you're designing even though he had no idea the way that it was written, no idea about what the internals were, no idea about the actual you know, GPIO, how the, how the IO actually worked. But he was able to actually look at it and think, how would I do that? And regardless of whether he was right or not, I mean, it's not relevant. The fact is that he was thinking about it, and that's one of the greatest benefits that we have out of this, and that we have something where the mentality is to think about it. The mentality is to learn. The mentality is to grow and say, how can we improve the world around us? Um, the tooling, you know, the, the I, you know, you can do it on any other operating system, but no other operating system actually pushes all the tools in front of you and says, go play. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, no, that, um, it, use, it doesn't have any onboard sound, not yet. Um, it can. Um, the Pi sound generation is not especially strong, the sound generation chip, because it's a $35 computer. Um, you could probably offset that, um, and eventually I would like to. Um, one of the things that I did not include in the MIDI spec was SysX controls. I'm not actually doing any... Um, MIDI controls notes, you can do note on, note off. You can do um, pitch bends, which, you know, the whole up and down warble thing. Um, you can also send system control commands. The SysX commands are um, it's just a basically a, a register that you write to, and you can basically do a system dump. I did not include SysX controls. And the reason this is relevant is because eventually I would like to turn it into a sampler. Eventually I would like to turn it into a synthesizer. Um, I would like to be able to, you know, using the, the Android app, um, tell it, now go into a mode where you're playing a sample whenever you're hitting this note, or playing, you know, and go on board. Um, and also have off-board control so I can actually send SysX and system dump and, and restore commands that way. But I haven't gotten there yet. Um, I'm not sure... SysX will be implemented a lot sooner than onboard synthesis will be, because onboard synthesis, actually generating sound is a very complicated, um, not very complicated. Once, you, once, once you're looking at the actual waves and the data coming out, it's not especially uh, drastically complicated, but generating good sounds is a little bit more involved. Um, generating a, a beep or a boop and like the old Atari sound, there's nothing to that, but that's also not usable musically unless you're trying to do Mario. But. Any other questions? Yes, sir. What, what's the hard OS? You said Linux, but particular distribution? Um, this is actually Raspbian. I'm mo moving over to Fedora, um, because I'm obviously a Red Hat employee. Uh, Pydora came out uh, a couple of weeks ago. So, um, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't, when I started doing the presentation, I didn't want to change everything underlying right before the presentation. Um, you see my beautiful slides. Um, that's an example of me changing something right before coming here. Last night it worked perfectly. This morning, uh, LibreOffice updated, nothing, uh, nothing works. Um, I didn't want to do that with the musical instrument. So um, the Fedora distribution actually um, 
probably will, will work a little bit better for it than Raspbian. Um, but from what, I have, from what I've seen, it's going to be a little bit easier to work with, but I haven't actually done enough testing with it yet. Do you think so. there's enough horsepower for synthesis? Um, depending on the nature of the synthesis, there are a lot of different approaches to sound generation. I'm probably going to go through analog, uh, analog simulation, which is really just taking a waveform and applying numbers to it. You know, it's doing rate transfer, doing frequency and, and pitch. Um, I'm probably not going to go for something that would really tax the horsepower beyond the CPU's ability to keep up. It's really, the limitation there will probably be actually generating the sound on board. Yes, sir? The uh, GPU actually uh, can be used also as an ESP, and they've actually published the, uh, uh, some of the code so uh, people can start using that. It was closed source, if you will. Yeah, I'm not, uh, does that go through the HDMI output, or does it actually use this, the 8th uh, the inch jack for it, though? Um, that's a good question. I know, that, I know that the HDMI output is actually pretty strong. Um, the 8th inch jack is not so strong. Um, but I don't know how to, I don't know myself how to get the HDMI output with sound only yet. Um, I mean, again, that's a problem that I want to solve. And that's sort of the whole point here. I've got a known thing. I know what I know. I'm determining what the problems are to solve, so that I can tell people, you know, if they want to do the same thing, if they want to do something like this, I can say, here are the things you're going to have to consider. Here, you can you can use this code if you really want to, um, you know, and, and you know, build your own system however you like. Anything else? Well, um, would anyone like to actually play the thing? Because it's actually, I mean, it's actually pretty strong. You know, the whole thing about, the, it's designed out of fence posts, believe it or not. The case is all fence posts. Um, and it really is designed to be very strong. We had, uh, we went to the Maker Fair a couple of weeks ago. And we had a bunch of people going through and they really were kind of playing whack-a-mole, which was kind of neat. And it made it through. Uh, it made it through the flight too. So that was actually my biggest my biggest concern. I figured people would you know stop banging on it once they saw chips of wood flying off of it, but the airport probably would not. So um, again, the, the ergonomics were actually pretty important. You know, it's about it's about four inches off. So the idea was that you could actually play it without breaking your ankles, um, which surprisingly, as a musician, your ankles factor in pretty heavily. So. You like to preserve your ankles. Right. Uh, anything else? Velocity sensitive? Uh, not yet. Uh, it's using digital input. Um, I would actually like to use velocity at some point. I thought about building a MIDI uh, marimba, or uh, I'd like to actually do drums at some point, uh, but not yet. Yes, sir? I'm sorry, say that again? Um, well, in terms of sampling, absolutely. I mean, you don't even really need to tie in a set of Raspberry Pis for sampling. Um, if I was trying to do a trumpet, for example, fluid synth would be fine. It's just basically doing you know, pitch transposition on a, uh, on a given sample set. Um, doing accurate trumpet, I mean, like if you're actually trying to simulate the way that a trumpet actually works in the real world, not a chance. Um, and honestly, I doubt that the Pi would be any good at that anyway, because, I mean, honestly, much bigger processors aren't very good at that. Um, in terms of actually generating sound, um, I, don't, I think the Pi itself, the processor is certainly capable of doing it. Um, you, you know, the Commodore 64 could generate a valid waveform. Um, of course, it had a dedicated chip for it, but even then, you're talking about a one megahertz processor driving another one megahertz processor. So, uh, if the Commodore 64 can generate something simulating a real sound, generating a, a real synthetic sound, the Broadcom in this thing certainly can. I mean, it's just numbers. It's just floating point numbers coming out. Um, you know, we mentioned the GPU. It's going to be able to do the, the actual processing. Generating, generating the waveform isn't even going to be difficult. The question is, how strong of a signal can we get out of the actual uh, onboard 
sound on the, the hardware. And, um, you know, do I actually know enough to generate a sound that's worth listening to? Um, this is calf synth, which is one, one of the mono synthesizers. It's just basically a, a square wave mixed with a sine wave, um, which is really pretty simple. And then it's got a resonance control on there, so it actually sounds that little, that wow sound. Um, and doing that's actually where the limitation is in, in generating the sound itself. Um, do I know enough to generate that filter? And the, and the answer to that right now is probably not. So, yes, sir. I don't know. It might. Um, I don't have enough experience working with those to tell you. Um, I know that the USB, like I could probably hook up an offboard sound, uh, an offboard amp, and get uh, a strong signal from that. So theoretically, you know, I could use that to get around the limitations of HDMI or the USB or the actual eighth inch jack, the sound jack in, on the Pi itself. Um, I haven't tried. Um, I wouldn't mind trying, um, but I, I mean, my first step is actually to work with the, I want to generate sound, I want to do the synthesis directly. Um, once I do the synthesis directly, then I can kind of figure out what do I need to actually use to, to pipe that out. My initial tests where the synthesis wasn't working well enough to actually use. Um, again, that's, all, that's always been a secondary task for me because um, I am driving something off, off board. Um, I, you know, I've got a, you know, it's a 30 foot cable going somewhere else to drive the synthesizers and it's a bank of synthesizers. So actually controlling it on board, um, it, it presents its own difficulties. The, uh, the mini MIG, the, the, one of the devices that actually kind of started the whole, you know, home synthesis movement was a pain because it didn't have any onboard memory. You know, if you twiddle the knob, you changed your sound. And if you're like thinking, well, no, what waveform was that? Let me go back to fix that. Well, you had to replicate it again. You it didn't have a way of storing it. They had memory moves later, but the memory moves were very were incredibly expensive compared to, um, you know, compared to the, the you know the actual the original device itself. And the original device was twelve hundred dollars back then. You know, so. Um, so, you know, actually working with those, working with the onboard sounds, you know, you, there's a whole lot more involved there than just can I generate a sound, but how do I preserve that sound and replicate it? That's one of the reasons why samplers are so popular, for that matter, because then you know I'm playing a trumpet, it looks like this. And also one of the reasons why CDs are so popular, because then you don't have a musician out there playing in the wrong note at any time ever. I mean, music is terrible, but at least it's predictable. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I have a super question. It's just a switch, right? There's no sensitivity as far as like how far you push it. That's correct. Um, this. Well, on a foot device, probably not. Um, for other devices, probably so. I do want to have velocity sensitivity in there, uh, and also pressure sensitivity, for that matter. I mean, it's fairly easy to do. It converts the input to analog rather than digital. Right now, it's just a set of 13 bits. Um, digital input's very simple, and whenever I go to velocity, I'm going to have to consider changing that to going to 13 analog inputs, or however many analog inputs. Um, it is fairly easy to do. I just didn't do it for this, because again, this is a, a MIDI pedal, so you're stepping on it. It's gonna be all the way down every time. So, anything else, guys? Well, yes, sir? Oh. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, I hope this has been instructive. Uh, I, again, I apologize for the lack of the slides. I'm going to you know, blame myself for doing an update this morning. Um, I hope that this has uh, been instructive again. It's all on the, on the web. If you would like to see the code and offer any improvements, or if you want to actually show me how to generate those waveforms, that'd be awesome. Um, and with that, I do. Thank you.
Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication. From Wicked. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business changing applications from small office phone systems to mission critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a thing that 
really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer bootcamp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates, 
Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.